Good morning. How are you guys? Awesome. Good to see you again. It's a super honor for me to be here once again and be able to share God's word with you guys. I'm really excited that you're here today because I know that right now on television there's a championship game going on. So you guys are saints for being here today. Uh, a mother one time was telling her children how they were saints, you know, because as, as Christians we're called saints. And, and finally her little boy was real sad by that. And she finally said, what's wrong? Why are you sad? And he goes, because I don't want to be a saint. I want to be a packer, he said. So, <laughs> so today you get to be a saint and a packer uh, if you want to be, or a cowboy, whatever you want to be. But anyway, glad you're here this morning. Let's open our Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And I want to talk to you this morning about how you should respond to the word of God. What should our attitude be? What should our response be? How, how can we allow the Word of God to truly transform our lives? And so the title of the message is Responding to the Word, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And if you're there already, look with me at verse 9, what Paul says. He says, For you remember, brethren, our labor and toil, for laboring night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. We preach to you the gospel of God. Verse 10, you are witnesses. And God also, how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe. As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his own children. And that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. For this reason we also thank God without ceasing. Because when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God which also effectively works in you who believe. Let's pray together. Father, as we open this book that we have in our laps this morning, God, your word, we ask that you would teach us what a gem, what a true treasure we have in our hands today, Lord, and all that you desire to do through it in our lives. Teach us by your spirit through the power of your word, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Well, an elderly woman was at sleep one night when she was awakened by a noise in the living room. When she went out into the living room, to her horror, she discovered a burglar had broken in and began to steal all of her stuff. And being overcome with fear, she whispered a little prayer in desperation. She said, help me, Jesus. And the burglar heard her. He couldn't see her because she was in the shadows, but he heard her and he started walking her direction and now she was even more overcome with fear and so without thought, like second nature, she just quoted her favorite Bible verse. She shouted out, Acts 2.38. And with that, the burglar stopped in his tracks, frozen, didn't move. In fact, to the point where she could dial 911 and call the police, the police came, arrested the guy and they were kind of curious, you know, this is an elderly woman, why didn't this guy run away? So they asked him, after they arrested him, the detective said, I'm curious, you could have ran away. It was just an old lady. Uh, why did you stay frozen in that one spot until the police came? To which the burglar replied and said, man, if you knew that lady was packing an ax and 238 revolvers, <laughs> you wouldn't have moved either. Ax 238. Here's what it says. It says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, and you shall receive power, the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Spirit through the spoken word of God. Let me ask you this morning, do you believe that God's word has power? You, you might say, well, that really wasn't the case here, though, Pastor. Maybe he just mistook God's word for weapons. But then again, the Bible does say that it is sharper than any two-edged sword, it's likened unto a weapon. We know that the, the word of God can be used to fight spiritual battles. We know the word of God can be used when we deal with temptation. We know we can anchor our hope in the word of God. So certainly, you might say there is an aspect in which it is a weapon. But the question is, do you believe that it has power? Do you believe it has power to even protect you or save you physically? Uh, let me just say this. We'd have to admit the word of God makes all the difference in the world, doesn't it? I heard the story of a GI that was uh, crashed in uh, some Pacific uh, Eastern islands and there was a tribe of cannibals that was on the island that he crashed on and he got uh, caught up by these guys and they took him as prisoner and he thought for sure he was gonna be somebody's meal but as he noticed these tribesmen were holding a book, he realized the book they were holding was none other than the Bible and he was blown away. He thought, what would these tribesmen be doing with the Bible? So he asked, you know, stirred up, excuse me, stirred up some courage and asked and said, hey, why are you guys, what's about this Bible? So they said, well, a missionary came many years ago and uh, he preached to us about Jesus and so we gave our lives to Christ and now we read this Bible. 
To which the GI said to him, well, you know, isn't that amazing? In America, we've outgrown that sort of thing. People don't believe the Bible anymore. To which the tribesmen responded and said, well, it's a good thing we've not outgrown it, because if it weren't for this book, you would be our evening meal tonight. <laughs> See, the Word of God has the ability to transform, to change. Even the most blatant atheist would have to agree that there's something powerful about the Word of God. I mean, imagine if you were an atheist and you were driving down a dark alley that had no turnaround, it was a dead end, and you're heading down there, and as you get to the very end of this dark alley, you run over something, you blow out two of your tires, so you get out to inspect, and as you're out there inspecting, all of a sudden around the corner comes this whole tribe of young people, they look like a bunch of hoodlums, and they're heading your direction, and you're picturing yourself you know, being beaten and taken captive and robbed and all the rest, so what do you do? Do you jump inside your car and drive off on flat tires? Do you hide in the car? But what if you're an atheist and you realize that group of young hoodlums is none other than a group of young boys coming from a Bible study and in all their hands is a copy of the scripture? What a difference that would make. Is it not true? Well, listen, one of the unique things about the Thessalonians that confounded many people, as Paul wrote this letter to the Thessalonians, they were awaiting the return of Christ. There was a lot of confusion, so he wrote to kind of settle the confusion. But in the midst of it, only being Christians for one month, because that's all that Paul got to spend with them, and having left because of persecution, these Thessalonians were anchored in the word of God. These Thessalonians were able to stand up against severe persecution and affliction, they were mature in their faith, even only being believers for one month. And you might ask the question, how was it that they were able to endure such difficult circumstances? Well, Paul tells us right here in verse 13. Look what he says. He says, for this reason, we thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. The reason they were doing so well is they received, welcomed, and believed the very words that Paul spoke to them to be the words of God. In fact, that word there that says um, effectively, it works effectively, it is the Greek word energio, where we get the English word energy or energetic, it means power, and it's really describing a supernatural, non-human power that's available, that, that happens when you, when you receive, when you welcome, and when you believe the word of God, it is a power, an energy that works in your life. You see, that's what Paul is saying. That's what God's word does when you believe it. It is a powerful arsenal in the hands and in the heart of every believer. In fact, one commentator put it this way. When we believe God's word and obey it, it's good and holy precepts, his spirit releases power, divine energy that works in our lives to fulfill his purposes. Do you believe that? Do you believe God's word can do that for you? I do. You can clap, go ahead. Charles Spurgeon one time, this was before there was microphones and PA systems, was gonna be speaking at a large cathedral one night, and so he went in early that day to do what you might call the equivalent of a sound check, and he walked up to the pulpit with a room full of empty seats, and he, they said, let's see how the, you know, the acoustics are in the room, and he began to say this over and over, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And that was echoing off the walls. And he repeated it. And he said it again and again three or four times. And little did he know that up in the rafters were a couple of men doing some repair work that were non-Christians, unbelievers. And as one of them heard those words repeated over and over again, he was pricked in his conscience so much that later that night he surrendered his life to Jesus Christ. All because of the word of God being spoken. You see, you could say he was saved by a sound check, right? And here's the reality, the penetrating power of God's eternal word does that to us. And no wonder Paul the Apostle said that we should be always ready to preach the word. And this is what Paul is encouraging these Thessalonians to do. You see, it's not just the word of God that saves us, it's also true that the word of God sanctifies us. It's how we grow and mature. And you and I will never be a solid, mature believer. You and I will never be able to endure hardships and trials and difficulties. You and I will never be able to take ground back in our lives unless we are regular students delving into, digging into the word of God on a regular basis. There'll be no spiritual growth and no spiritual progress apart from it. That's why Peter says to desire the pure milk of the word that you might grow thereby. That's why Paul said in Romans, he said that faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of God. Our faith actually grows the more we hear it. 
And even Jesus said that we are sanctified by the truth. We're set apart. We're changed. We're transformed. We're made into the image of Jesus through the word of God. And that's why this church and many others like it emphasize the importance of the word of God. We preach it. We have things on the video that talk about reading the Bible every day for 2015. Read through the whole Bible. Get into the word of God because we realize that there's no way that we can progress forward without the word of God. And listen, the Thessalonians did. But you might say, well, what did they do to be able to be transformed by the word? And that's what I want to point out to you, what Paul says they did in response to the word. There's, word. There's four things I want to point out. Number one is that they received the word. Look again at verse 13. He says there, when you received the word of God, you, as you heard it from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it actually is the word of God. That word for received is basically a reference to when Paul came and shared the gospel in the church or in the city of Thessalonica and the people got saved and a church was born. They received it and therefore they were saved. In fact, that word received basically means in the original language to take something or carry away something, receiving a transmission or getting a message and saying, I got the message. It's kind of like when I, if I was to send you all a text right now and you all said, okay, I got it. That's the word received. You received the text. It means to hear it, to take it in, and to accept it. Uh, speaking of football today, of course, it's kind of like a wide receiver running down the field. The quarterback throws the ball. The wide receiver goes up. He gets the ball. He accepts the ball. He takes the ball, and he possesses it, right? Now, I don't get very many opportunities to relive my short football career, uh, but when I was in high school, I pay, played junior varsity high school football at the staggering height of five foot, one inch tall, and uh, less than 100 pounds. And... Uh, my position was third left string, third string left bench, and uh, basically that meant uh, I never hardly got in the game. The only time I got in the game was when we were so far ahead, the coach knew that I wouldn't be able to blow the game for them, and that way we would feel good when we're riding home on the bus that we all participated in the game that we won, but really we had nothing to do with the win at all, right? Does anybody understand what I'm talking about? That was my short-lived career, but listen, one day after the practice, the coach says, hey, we're going to do a wide receiver contest. Everybody's welcome to participate in it. We're going to find out who's the best receiver on the entire team. So I thought, what the heck? I'm really short, but I got good hands. And so I went out for it. And after about five or six rounds, there was only three people left. And yes, yours truly was among the three left, right? And uh, so I go out for that, that next to the last pass. And I'm running out. I do like a bar, you know, a, whatever you call a post. And the quarterback throws it up. And I'm running this way, but the ball's going that way. And so I just, you know, with all that was in me, I turned around, I jumped and closed my eyes and, and the ball came right down into my hands and I fell on the ground and I held onto the ball and the coach went nuts. What an excellent catch. Who just made that catch? Who made that catch? And then when I got up and he looked at me, do set. <laughs> I know what he's thinking. You, I couldn't have been one of my first string guys, you know? You're like the third string bench. I said, yeah, because I just beat all your first string guys. That's why. And uh, so I caught the ball. And the whole picture I'm trying to get there is, is I got the ball, I received the ball, I took the ball in. That's the exact word Paul's using here. And by the way, I didn't get a promotion on that, but I did move up to second string bench after that. But anyway, that's a side story. Here's the reality. Paul's saying that's what the Thessalonians did. They heard the word, they took it in, they accepted it. What a great thing to do. J. Vernon McGee once asked, how do you receive the word of God? Do you receive it as the word of God or do you get angry? Does the hair on the back of your neck stand up? He said, twice in all my years of ministry, a man approached me after the sermon and said, did I have him in mind when I was preaching? And he got angry at me. He asked me, did somebody tell me about him? But listen, I didn't have him in mind. I didn't even know him. The real issue was that the word of God was coming and he wasn't receiving it. Rather, he was rejecting it. You see, we have a choice. Are we gonna receive it or are we gonna reject it? James chapter 1, verse 21 says, Therefore put aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness in humility. Receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. It's able to save your souls. So listen, the Thessalonians received it, but it didn't stop, stop there. Notice what he says as well in verse 13. He says they received it and says without, um, excuse me, verse 13, he says, For this reason we thank God without ceasing, because when you receive the word of God, which you heard, from us you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but what it was in truth, the word of God. So they also welcomed it. You see, to receive it means that you got the transmission, you accept the transmission, but to welcome it, in the original language, it means to embrace it or to make it your own. 
It'd be like if I took that football and go, I'm not ever giving it back. It's mine now, right? That's what it means. It means to make it your own. In other words, not just receiving and accepting it, you have to also make it your own. And the only way you can do that is you got to put it into practice. you got to do it. you got to act upon it. That's why James says, do not be a hearer of the word only, but be a doer of the word. A hearer of the word is like a man who goes and sees his face in the mirror and then walks away and quickly forgets what kind of man he is. So is somebody that only hears the word but doesn't do it. What he's saying is if you only hear it and you don't do it, all it is is in one ear and out the other and it never changes your life. You gotta do something with it. You gotta do the word. Warren Wearsby said the word receive means hearing of the ear, that you got it. Second word means hearing from the heart. It's sunk deep down and has become a part of who you are and begins to affect your thoughts and your actions. See, that's what's gotta happen. We can hear it, we can accept it, we can even agree with it, but if we don't allow it to affect the way we live, then it's not gonna be able to do what God wants it to do in our lives. I think sometimes people come to that first step, they accept it and receive it, but they don't take the next step, and that is to put it into practice because they feel like, well, as long as I receive it, as long as I accept it, as long as I acknowledge it, then I'm okay, and they kind of rest their consciences right there but listen, we gotta put it into practice. It's kinda like somebody that says, well, I know adultery is wrong, you know, I know I'm in this adulterous affair and I know it's wrong, it's just so wrong and I agree with God that it's wrong, but it doesn't do you any good unless you stop doing it and change, right? And we can agree that something is true all day long until we're blue in the face, but until we actually do it, then can we really say we believe it? No, we gotta do it, we gotta put it into practice. If you don't change our behavior, it has no effect. Vance Havner once said this, it's like window shopping, right? You gaze fondly, but you buy nothing. Bible window shoppers moves along through the books of the Bible, reading all the precious promises, hearing all the high challenges, looking at all its deep messages of power and peace and victory. But he never makes it his own. He appreciates, but never appropriates. The storehouse of God's word is never meant for scrutiny, not even primarily for study, but for sustenance. It's not simply a collection of proverbs and noble teachings for man to admire and quote like he would Shakespeare, it is rations for the soul, resources for the spirit, treasure for the inner man. You see, here's the challenge. That's what God's word does. Rather than receive it and accept it and do it, people instead today question it, doubt it, and ultimately reject it. We might even come to church and say, like a lot of people in the world say, well, I don't believe the Bible because the Bible was written by men, right? And I'll deal with that in just a few moments. But listen, the Thessalonians didn't believe that. In fact, it says right here, they received it and welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it was in truth, the word of God. Erwin Lutzer said, if we are to withstand the onslaught, we must be convinced in our own minds that what we have is a message from God to us. You see, the Thessalonians did. They they received it, they welcomed it, and then thirdly, they believed it. They believed it was the word of God. That's what he says there. When you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it actually is the word of God, which effectively works in you who believe. They believed it. This is a remarkable verse because basically what they're saying is we believe that the words that Paul spoke, by the way, words of men, weren't just words of Paul. They were actually the word of God. And because they believed that, it became effective. So to have the word of God powerfully transform us, we must receive it, we must welcome it, and we must believe it and not write it off as the word of men, but to believe it for what it really is, and that is the word of God. I like what Greg Laurie used to say all the time. He says, you know, a lot of people will say to God, God, show me and I'll believe. And Greg says, what we need to say is God, what God says to us in return, Greg says, is God says, believe and I will show you. In other words, if you take it for what it claims to be, what you will discover is that it's indeed the word of God. And this is a radical claim because, again, what the people of Thessalonians were saying was that Paul's words were scripture. Paul's words, the word of a man, was the word of God. And this is something that we see over and over in the Bible. Luke says that Paul's words were the word of God. Acts chapter 13, verse 44 says, on the next Sabbath day, the whole city came together to hear the word of God. It was Paul preaching. But they came to hear the word of God. They believed what Paul spoke and what Paul wrote was the word of God. And now we have books like you know, Romans and Galatians and Acts, or not Acts, but First and Second Corinthians and Thessalonians, all written by Paul, all today claim to be the word of God. And then, of course, Peter calls what Paul wrote the word of God, and Paul calls what Peter wrote the word of God. It says there in Second Peter chapter 3 that all that Paul to- taught was scriptures. And so we know that the New Testament is filled with this 
In fact, the entire Bible repeats, claims repeatedly to be the word of God. 863 times the Old Testament prophets rang out, thus says the Lord. 90 times in the New Testament, New Testament's New Testament writers wrote the word, it is written. In other words, as a source of their authority was the word, written word of God. 56 times the, specific, the Bible is specifically called the word or words of God. And John MacArthur said that 3,800 times in the Old Testament alone, the human authors referred to their writings in one way or another as the word of God. And in fact, when the disciples in the book of Acts were making their rounds and they were preaching and proclaiming the gospel, they called it the word of God. It's the word of God. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness, that the man or woman of God may be thoroughly equipped, ready for every good work. It is literally God-breathed. God breathed on it. And it was the word of God. Remember when God created Adam in the garden? The Bible says out of the dust of the earth God created him. And then it says, and he breathed on him the breath of life. And he became a living being. And in the same way as God moved upon the holy authors of scripture to write, God breathed into it and it became the breath of life and it became the living word of God. That's why 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21 says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation for prophecy never came by the will of men. In other words, it wasn't man's idea. It wasn't man's creation. It wasn't man's will but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Yeah, the Bible was written by men. Men moved by the Holy Ghost, literally carried along, borne along by the Spirit of God. Norman Geisler, a great theologian, said it's broken logic to claim that because the Bible was written by human beings who erred, that the Bible must be full of errors. First off, he said, humans don't always err. And secondly, they never erred when guided by the Holy Spirit, who cannot err, but who leads us into all truth. He said, men can write true statements. If I were to stand here today and say George Washington was the first president of the United States, that would be an absolutely 100% true statement. So see, I could say something true. In the same way, God moved upon holy men by his spirit to write the words of God. You know, uh, it wasn't a trance. It wasn't like they went to this, like, you know, eyes rolled back in the head, and they were, like, zoned out, and the Holy Spirit, they just, you know, like on uh, Indiana Jones, just writing something down as, the, as their eyes were rolled back. No, no, he used their personalities. He used their experiences. He used the things that they wrote, and God breathed into that his word. And so what we have today before us is the word of God. And listen, the Thessalonians believed that. And as a result of believing that, it leads us to our fourth thing, and that is that they were transformed by the word of God. Look what it says there in the end of verse 13, which also effectively works in you who believe. Listen, it effectively works. You should underline that. Effectively works. It's supernatural energy to transform your life if you believe. Chuck Swindoll put it this way. News articles may inform us. Novels may inspire us. Poetry may enrapture us. But only the active living word of God can transform us. If you believe, God's word has the power to transform your heart, your mind, your life. He'll make you a holy person, a new person from the inside out. He'll make you like Jesus. And that's what Paul said about the Thessalonians. In fact, look with me at verse 14. He says, for you, brethren, because they effectively received the word of God, you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God, which are in Judea in Christ Jesus, for you suffered the same things from your own countrymen, just as they did from the Judeans, who killed both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us, and they do not please God. They are contrary to all men. What's Paul saying? He's saying you guys endured incredible persecution and hardship. How? Why? Because they believed the word of God and they had an anchor for their souls. They had something to hold on to in the midst of their struggles. You see, all of us will face persecution, and the Thessalonians showed us to, in order to endure that, they had to believe and know the word of God. Paul said, whatever things were written were written for our learning that through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, we might have hope. It's through the scriptures we find hope. Now listen, I'm not trying to, to be, play Bible all, idolatry or, or say that the Bible is more important than Jesus. The whole point of it is that this all points to somebody, does it not? It all points to Christ. It all points to the one who loved us, who gave himself for us. Everything we study, everything we learn in scripture, in fact, the Bible says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and the word became flesh and dwelt among us in the person of Jesus. 
All of Scripture points to him. We just sung that a little bit ago. Everything is about Jesus. It all points to him, the lover of our soul, the one who gave himself for us. You see, that's why we emphasize the need for the word of God, because only it can be an anchor and only it can transform us. I heard the story Ravi Zacharias told of a man by the name of Hein Pham, a Vietnamese man that was taken captive by the Viet Cong, and he was imprisoned, and they were re repeatedly brainwashing him. He didn't have any personal items whatsoever. He was a Christian, and he didn't have any form of scripture at all. And so here he was being brainwashed day after day, and they were saying to him that you've been deluded, there is no God, you've been a victim of American imperialism, and, and day after day this began to wear on him, and finally he began to break, and he said, maybe they're right, maybe there is no God, and he made a firm decision that night to walk away from God. The next morning, however, he was assigned to one of the most despicable, demeaning, humiliating tasks that there was for every, even a prisoner to do, and that was to to empty the trash cans filled with papers soiled with human waste, basically the toilet paper. And as he was cleaning out these disgusting buckets and the smell was awful and there was flies everywhere, he kind of noticed on one of the papers there was something that looked a little familiar, but he wasn't sure what it was, so he took it and he kind of dusted off the grime and he stuck it in his pocket until he got back to his cell a little bit later that evening. And as he got back, he opened it up and began to brush it up and realized at the very top corner were the words Romans 8. And as he scrolled down through the scripture there, he came to that very famous verse. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God and have been called according to his purpose. And he was just absolutely amazed. He was absolutely blown away and extremely encouraged. He said, you know what? God is speaking to me right now. God is encouraging me not to give up. And so the next day he got up and goes, I want to do that same job again today. Nobody did that. And they sent him out there again, and he was able to gather up many more portions of the scripture, which, by the way, they were using as toilet paper. And he put them in his pocket and was eventually able to almost assemble the entire book of Romans. And you know what he said? When I was reading the scriptures, my soul was lifted. My heart was encouraged. I had more hope and more strength to endure. You see, God's word gives hope, and that's what so many people have discovered in the midst of trials and hardships. In fact, I read a statistic that said if they were to put 100 scholars and professors on a deserted island to live for the rest of their lives, and they could only bring three books with them. What three books would they choose? And a large majority of them said that they would want the Bible, even many that were atheists and agnostic, because they recognized the power of God's word in a person's life. Let me just say this. It was, it was the Thessalonians' ability to endure and suffer because they anchored themselves in the hope of God's word. They responded to the word of God in the right way. They received it, and they made it their own. They welcomed it. They believed it as the word of God, and God began to transform and to change him. And listen, as you and I await the return of Jesus Christ, as you and I await what God's gonna do here in this church in the coming days, months, weeks, years ahead, as God begins to work in our life in the midst of whatever it is that we're going through right now, we can know that God's word promises us that God is going to do it and he wants to change us and transform us and prepare us for all he has. But we need to be open to receiving, welcoming, and believing God's word and God will do it in our lives. An anchor for our lives to hold on to. And that's why we stress it here this year. Let me, let me give you a challenge as I close out our service this morning. As I want to challenge you. You know, we have many infomercials on TV right now. You have the T28, and you have the Insanity, and you have the P90X and all these different things. that They say, you know, if you do this for 90 days, your body will be radically transformed. And so we run out, and we give hours of our time to try and transform our, our bodies. But I got a better transformation for you. It's a soul transformation. And if you were to take the Word of God and spend 28 minutes, instead of T28, make it B28, Bible for 28 minutes a day, every day for the next, not 90 days, not even 60 30 days, and I guarantee you, at the end of 30 days, if you devote yourself to that, you will begin to see a transformation take place in your heart and in your life and in your soul. <laughs> Amen? So that's my challenge to you, Calvary Chapel South Bay. Take the word of God at its word. Believe it to be the word of God, and let's see what God does in you and through you this next year. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word this morning, and God, we wanna be those people those people who receive, who welcome, who believe your word is true. And Lord, that you would change our lives by the spirit of God through the word of God and making us people of God that follow after you. Lord, help us. 
And maybe there's some of you this morning that have yet to make the first step in following Jesus Christ. And you're not a follower of Christ. The Bible says that if, unless we've received him as our Lord and Savior, that we are outside the family of God and that we are destined for a place called hell. But God is a God of love, and that's why Jesus came. God is a God of justice, that he must judge our sin, but he's also a God of love, and that's why he sent Jesus to die on the cross to pay the price for our sins, that through faith in him we could be forgiven, that God offers us in exchange our sin for Jesus' perfection and his righteousness. And if we would but come to Christ, we could be forgiven of all our sins, and we can begin this journey with God that, that takes not only the course of our lifetime, but into all eternity. And this morning, if you've joined us and you've never yet surrendered to Christ, as our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, Jesus is calling you right now. And he's saying to you, receive me. He's saying to you, surrender to me. Give your life, give your heart to me. Let me guide you, let me lead you, let me fulfill your life more than anything else could. And let me someday, when it's your time to go, take you into glory, where you'll forever be in my presence. And this morning, if you've joined us and you've never yet surrendered to Christ, you can do it right now, right where you sit. He's inviting you, he's calling you, and he's saying, come, surrender to me. And as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, you'd say, Pastor, that's me. I'm ready to surrender, I'm ready to come, I'm ready to live for God, live for Christ. Today and every day, I wanna become a follower of Jesus Christ and the Bible says that you must acknowledge your sin before a holy God. You must turn from that sin. And you must ask Jesus to lead your life, to surrender your heart to him. The Bible says whoever confesses with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and believes in their heart, God raised him from the dead, will be saved. As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. Whoever believes on him would not perish, but have everlasting life. You must believe and receive and surrender but he offers to come into your life right now and begin to give you a whole new life. And you can do it right now, right where you sit, by calling out to him in that way, Jesus, forgive me, come into my life. I give it to you, I surrender today, believing in you and receiving you. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. And everyone who agreed with me said, amen, amen and amen.